Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am here with a very special episode. Yes, it is a Tuesday and I'm here with a conversation episode. And do you know why? It's because it's a conversation episode that I know so, so, so many of you are going to want to hear. Of course, I think you should want to hear all my conversation episodes because I talk with really cool people about really dorky shit. But this one, well, there is a certain webcomic that started out about the same time as I started this podcast, really coincidentally, and one which people still to this day recommend to me, and I find it so precious when anyone thinks that I haven't already heard of it, and it's so well-meaning and lovely, and it's just because everyone fucking loves Lore Olympus so much myself included. I absolutely love Rachel Smyth's Lore Olympus. It is a super fun webtoon um, that is retelling the story of Hades and Persephone in a way that I love. And that says a lot because I'm pretty picky about that couple, as you all may well know. Um, But Lore Olympus is just doing it so beautifully. Rachel's work is so gorgeous. The illustrations are stunning. And the whole story has so much depth and meaning and the way that she's using the gods and the goddesses and these characters of myth is so unique and lovely. And anyway, I follow it week to week. I do the fast pass. I love it so much. And the reason I'm talking to Rachel, aside from the fact that she and I have been Twitter friends for a long time and we've been meaning to to chat, is because Laura Olympus is coming out as a print edition of the book, which is really cool. I love print copies of books, especially when they're beautiful, full-color graphic novels about Greek mythology. Like, yes, fucking please. Um, So today, I talked to Rachel about Lore Olympus. In hindsight, did we talk that much about it being a print book? No. But that was the reason that we talked. Um, We talked about mythology generally, Lore Olympus, what she's doing with Lore Olympus, and sort of everything therein um, about sourcing and finding sources and our own obsession with primary sources. And just generally, we had such a good time. We, it's really, it was just such a fun conversation. It was so incredible to talk to Rachel. Um, And I just know that you're all going to enjoy it so, so much. So if you have haven't already pre-ordered your copy of Lore Olympus in physical, beautiful book form. It comes out the day this podcast is released, hence this episode coming out on a Tuesday. That is November 2nd. The book is available and I personally am so excited for it and I was so thrilled to get an advanced copy and be considered for all this. Feels so fancy. Anyway, I'm a super dork. This was such a fun conversation. I know you're all going to love it because so, so, so many of you just already love Lore Olympus and God, it was just so much fun to talk to Rachel. So here you go. This is episode 143, Adapting Greek Myth, The World of Lore Olympus with Rachel Smythe. so much for doing this and thank you for having me oh gosh i'm very nice thrilled too i'm very (laughs) thrilled i mostly just want to talk about your use of mythology generally Mm -hmm. so obviously like i mean the depictions of hades and persephone are going to be like the biggest things for everybody for for me i love their relationship in lore olympus but i also just absolutely am obsessed with like every other character and i think that's just like (laughs) The like the general mythology nerd in me where I'm like, yeah, like I like them. They're like, I'm a big fan, but I'm also like Eros is one of my favorite characters or like your Poseidon. I want to make sure you talk, not just me like talking about how much I love all the individual ones. So I just kind of want to, I mean, I guess just get a sense of like, how did you set about creating your version of all of these characters? Like who, I mean, maybe like who did you start with or who kind of gives you the most inspiration does that sound like a question you can answer it does. It a question like, at all? <laughs> so it's, that's a huge a question no I think um god it's kind of like one of those how long is the piece is like it's such a you know a big I know. part of it and like 
much time I have spent sitting being like, how do I answer this question <laughs> in an articulate and intelligent way? But I think maybe one of the the, the strongest uh, point that I have really is the questions that I have around mythology when I read it. So, mm. I mean, we have a lot of like what we do know, which is great. But there's yeah, like oh. a lot of what we don't like. <laughs> oh. I, I'm like, you know, you read it and you're like, but I have questions, positive questions, but like the likelihood of us getting the answers to those questions. I <laughs> oh mean, God. I would love it if someone was like, we have ex- excavated a site and we've found like, I don't know, some <laughs> some scroll and it's got all the answers on it that you wanted to know. <laughs> So could I you think, imagine? Like, oh, oh my it god! Would be a party. It would be like I'd be like, "Give me there. I want to know. Tell me this." <laughs> so, but um, yeah, I think it is very much about like joining the dots. So, I really, I'm sorry. This is going to be such a, a long winded answer, but no, please. Okay, so Those like this favorite. is bit, this is bit in the Odyssey, right? Okay, there's a bit in the Odyssey where there's like a bard and he's singing the story he's telling the story of um Aphrodite Hephaestus <laughs> and Ares mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you know this is fantastic little this story and that's all like oh oh the women don't come with modesty like they don't come and look at Aphrodite being st- stuck in this you know uh net with uh with <laughs> Ares but there is a bit that always leaves me like I just want to know and like even maybe you might know because I'm not like <laughs> I don't have like any sort of like classic classics qualification or anything <laughs> like that but like so Poseidon is like why are you doing this Hephaestus I like find like he's like let me help you because I think even at the time they're all like I mean this is like very juicy but also deeply shameful and like the context is there because you should because they talk about like the, the the female goddesses do not come they're like we stay at home because this is so scandalous this is a very scandalous story and even <laughs> zeus is like the vibe that i get he's he's like god <laughs> what a mess and poseidon's like oh you're, this is kind of shameful don't uh, what are you doing what are you doing and Hephaestus is like i'm very upset <laughs> I'm very distraught. And Poseidon's like, I will pay, like, I think it's like the dowry back or something. And I'm like, what bones do you have in this, though, Poseidon? What bones? Like, what is your stake in this? And I still, like, you'd think, like, if it was if it was Zeus, it would make sense to me. Because he, like, I think, arranged this. It's his thing that he arranged, mm-hmm. as far as I know. But suddenly Poseidon is there being like, I've got you. And I'm like, what? Now you're reasonable? <laughs> like, no, that, and it that really, is... like, and it keeps me awake. <laughs> I'm like, why? Why did he care? Because he generally seems to be, like, Poseidon seems to be very chaotic. And yes. <laughs> I, I have never thought about this question, and now it will keep me up at night. If you find because, out, please let me know. But you're right. Like, Poseidon, I mean, which leads me directly into I'm so obsessed with your take on Poseidon because he is ridiculous in the best possible way. And, like, real Poseidon is, like, violent in a really depressing kind of he's way. He's very surly. Like, he's yeah. Captain Surly out of all of them, as yeah, far he's, as I understand. Yeah. That, that, yeah, no, he's the most, like, if anyone's going to get mad, it's him. He's going to get mad. Like, Yeah, he's going to get mad, and he tends to, like, be, a, like, just a more violent person, which is why I enjoy yours, where he's just, like, silly. <laughs> yeah, I think, like, for, I think for the most part, I kind of think of, like, you've got, you've got these three brothers, and I kind of think about them as variations of one man. That's kind mm. of the takeaway that I get from it is like, I mean, obviously this is, this doesn't have to be the be all end all. It's just like, I think about them like, and it just seems like it just comes off as like, are they just like three variations of one man? Because you quite often see like to, to cut a long sh- story short, like they'll refer to uh, Hades as Dark Zeus or like 
Zeus of the Earth or something because they don't want to say Hades or whatever because it's very scary. Very scary. <laughs> I always think about the ocean and what that means for someone in the ancient, ancient world, right? Like the ocean is where you're going to get a lot of your resources from. It's how you travel. Like you're not getting in an airplane. <laughs> you're not. You're, you're taking your boat. So it's very scary, but like very plentiful. So that's kind of my, you know, how I go about thinking about Poseidon. Because like Poseidon at the moment in the story is not really the main, he's not a main, main character. Like he's there. And later on, he'll probably have some more stuff to do. Ooh. No spoilers. Or maybe <laughs> he won't. No spoilers. But like, you know, that that's kind of how I go about it. Is I'm like, what is this, you know, this person who, oh, that's the other thing is I kind of like the idea of him being, like, like I said, he's, he, he he seems to read as someone who is quite, uh, I guess, yes, surly and violent, and you know, he'll he, he's he seems less reasonable, but mm-hmm. I mean that that I we could make that case about most uh characters from <laughs> mythology, to be honest. Um, and I kind of think about you know, like Lord of the Flies, and there's that character Piggy. Piggy is the smartest character, but unfortunately he is the least articulate. So nobody takes him seriously. So I kind of apply the same sort of uh, thing to Poseidon in the sense that he actually does have a lot of smart things to say. Like occasionally he'll drop some sort of truth bomb in a very (laughs) articulate way. But for the most part, they're like, oh, the sea is unruly and random. And, you know, he's kind of just going to do his thing. So... I think that's that's how that's how I think about Poseidon. I mean, obviously, if I'm at, like, I think this is a statement that's probably going to come up a lot in this interview because we're talking about adaptations, and it's always going to be, you know, the elephant in the room. <laughs> but like, I am aware that he is not like beat for beat the same as like Poseidon from mythology. I mean, of course, I could sit down and you know create a piece of media that is a beat for beat translation of Poseidon but you know what would that look like it would just be him like fighting with Athena yeah I mean the text already exists he's already there and he's already great in the source material and I personally don't think that I have anything to like add oh yeah no I, I was just like I I think your Poseidon is just a lot better than real Poseidon because if you were to depict him real he would definitely be like a bit more boring, but also like most of his stories are just him being violent to women, like uh, honestly, like nine out of 10. And that's not fun. Like that's not a fun character, you know, whereas I love like that. Yeah. Like he occasionally has his truth bombs, but otherwise he's just kind of like a sidekick in the best sort of way where he's just sort of there in the background sometimes doing silly things and I, I I just fully enjoy that about him but I think adaptation in general is like I mean it's important to make changes because you I mean obviously you have to make changes in order to make a story work for now but especially mm-hmm. just because you're right like that story already exists the original one so why retell it beat for beat like what yeah what does that add yeah I mean personally like I don't really look at my characters and think oh, they they are better than the existing text in any way. I'm just like, this is just me. Like, it's obviously obviously the characters are, like, deeply compelling from mythology and that's why we like them. That's why we, Mm -hmm. you know, that's why people are obsessed with them. That's why they've stuck around for so long. But I think if you're, like, doing an adaptation for, like, I guess a certain market, you need to be like, how is this going to look through modern day uh, sensibilities? Like, what is Mm -hmm. going to work? So... Like, some stuff is not going to translate well. Like, uh, I guess for an example of what I personally really struggled with is there's uh, the, the myth of um, Eros and Psyche, where there is a lot of, like, I mean, there's a lot of questions around, like, consent, like, today. Like, I'm sure at the mm-hmm. time they were like, you know, this is fine. But, like, now it's like, I mean, I can't write a story about a man being like, I'm invisible and I'm coming <laughs> into this mansion and we're going to do it, but you're never going to see me. And I'm like, that, like, I can't, like, serve that up in the year 2021 and not have a few eyebrows raised. <laughs> like, and, like, obviously we have context 
for these stories where we're like, I mean, we understand this of the time in like the world, the ancient worlds, we have that context to kind of explain what's happening there within a modern context. It just doesn't, it does not do, unless you're trying to make a different type of comic, but you know, it's a, you know, it all depends. Oh yeah. I, I think the same thing. I mean, even I covered Cupid and Psyche really early on in the podcast. And I think I even romanticized it too much because for me, it's like the first myth I found as a kid. And so mm-hmm. I had this like romantic attachment to it in a way that is like maybe, you know, has skewed even my thoughts on it. So yeah, I mean, that story specifically, it is it is such an interesting one because the the <laughs> the questions of consent should be very obvious. But I think so often uh, it's like drilled into your head as being romantic because the, the stories is you know it's meant to be romantic and it always has been sort of taken that way but then if you really do look at it objectively yeah it's like no she is literally like basically kidnapped to a palace (laughs) and then an invisible guy to comes like comes to her at night like that's not ideal definitely not yeah and i mean yeah it's all about like context right but yeah, I mean, like, I had the same thing for, like, Hades and Persephone, where it was, like, a myth that I came to as a very young person. So I was like, to me, it's very romantic to me as a child. So I have that. I have that bias. Like, I realized as an adult, everyone has their favorite. But I think kind of the thing that is so compelling about all of these characters is that, you know, you've got, like, none of them are perfect. They all do, except for, like, maybe... Prometheus like did he ever do a bad like has he ever done like a bad by like modern standards well I suppose it depends well yeah by modern standards no probably not because Prometheus is like another personal fave of mine like I always find him very interesting because he just seems very like of the people well I mean yeah he is quite yeah quite literally of the people (laughs) given the fire but like for the most part, I think that's why we, you know, are so fascinated by them is they do good and bad, and that's that's, you know, like most people were all out there doing good and bad, you know, it makes them very textured. Yeah, and they they are just, I mean, on top of the good and bad, but they're just really complex generally, you know, like they really do have sort of everything to them especially in those certain stories we get i mean cupid and psyche is is an example definitely you know hades and persephone and so many of the other ones when we have like a full blown story which so often we don't but when we do there really is so much like yeah i mean the stories the story of of aphrodite and Ares and hephaestus like that alone is like one of the most ancient stories there is and it is wild in so many different ways i mean there's lots of ways you can come at it in terms of like interpreting it but on its surface it is a lot there is so much going on there and i just that alone is like a fascinating way to look yeah, at yeah for sure like i think oh so much of the fun of it for me is like you read these myths right and you're like that's outrageous it's so like delightfully absurd in some bits and you're like oh my gosh what is happening here and part of what is so exciting about it is going and learning about the ancient world and slowly contextualizing all these statements that is learning why they're saying what they're saying I mean for example there's so many times where they bring up like a girdle and the Homeric come to Demeter they're always talking about her girdle like hanging low and I'm like (laughs) I know that she does not have a girdle as we understand what a girdle is now (laughs) What is that? Like, you know that she's not out there just with a a modern day girdle on. Like, it's got to be something else. So, like, working out what that item of clothing is, is is very exciting for me. (laughs) But, like, that's so true. Yeah. uh, The other thing, like, so this has actually always got me. So, in the Odyssey, there's this bit where uh, I think it's like, when Odysseus is like almost at home he's almost at home and he goes to (laughs) that he goes to their island and I think he still has to reveal that he's Odysseus and they're like come on guys let's do sports and they all start doing sports and someone is like (laughs) you don't look like you do sports at all and he starts to cry 
and they're like, oh my god, everyone chill out. I just use this crying because he, he feels like he's bad at sports. And for a long time, I thought this was like, I, like it's amazing, but also I'm like, why is he crying about <laughs> sports? Like, but then I was listening, like there's a lecture that I listened to. Basically, he, he's crying because you know, sports were, like, very closely linked with training to be a warrior. So basically what they're saying is, like, you don't really look like a warrior. And he's like, oh, my God, I don't... Like, the shame of, like, losing face, not being good at the thing that he really wants to be seen as being good at. And that's why he's upset. And then you're like, oh, that makes so much more sense. You know, learning about what these people valued, what was important to them what was not important at all to them. It's just fascinating. Just, it's great. No, I agree entirely. I mean, especially Odysseus. He's such an emotional man, so he can be, he can be so much. So when it comes to stuff like that, then, like, to turn it back to Lore Olympus, because as much as I also just love talking about mythology, I'm like, oh, people are going to be mad at me if I don't also ask <laughs> <them> about <laughs> Lore <enough>. Olympus. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, when it comes to, like, if that's, that's the part that fascinates you so much how does that translate into the show like I know you do drop a lot of really subtle and like interesting connections to the ancient world even though you're covering it in a modern world but do you think about that part a lot like how much Mm -hmm. ancient you're putting in yeah um it kind of it's sort of like this weird like the universe that they live in within Laura Olympus is like this weird kind of like like, it's modern day, but it's not actually meant to be our modern day. Like, it's mm-hmm. influenced by what we know and, like, things that we may find, like, shocking or might make us happy. But it's also, like, very much, like, I very much try to go and inform this world with things that are still important to the ancient world. There's, like, mm-hmm. an episode where, like, Persephone's, like, family comes to visit her and they, they bring a cow as a gift. And this makes total <laughs> sense. He's like, yeah, I got a cow. Also, like, Hades is very happy about receiving this cow. And I'm like, it's a good gift. It's a good gift to get a cow. <laughs> um, what else? I think there's, like, a lot. So it's not, yeah, again, it's, like, not a one-to-one tr- translation of it's here and now, like, it's, it's, it's got, like, you know, I try to put in these elements where I can. Um, mm-hmm. And again, I think... For me, the myth itself has so much yield in terms of what, how you can interpret it. If you said to me, like, Laura Lovis is gone, your work is gone, start over, I'd be like, yay! And like, I would just start like <laughs> a different interpretation, even if I finished it. And I was like, Laura Lovis is done now, it's complete. And someone was like, do you want to make another thing about Hades and Persephone? I'd be like, can I? Oh my gosh, like, there's so much you can do with it like there's so many interpretations in there and also it's very exciting because there's not a lot of stories about women mm-hmm. like you know <laughs> like this and this mm-hmm. is like this a story like revolves primarily around Demeter and it's amazing it's amazing to have this whole body of text to tell us things that we may not know about the ancient world and it's just it's very cool and so I I just sorry I'm losing my track of thought because I'm so excited to be talking about this I'm like oh my god like I've talked to everyone I know already but like you could okay so number one you could do like this fantastic feminist story about like Demeter and her search for like her daughter that's great because it's like it's unheard of it's unheard of for like someone they live in a patriarchal society within the context of this story and basically Zeus has been like I've given your daughter away that's it (laughs) you're not getting her back and again like oh yeah Elizabeth Van Diver that's her name is she like her lectures are like fire if you ever want to hear like somebody roast like the hero's journey it's great she will roast that there it's fantastic well she's kissed but she 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 does great lectures and she uh if you ever want to have like really solid information about like Hades and Persephone and that myth she's great but I'm going to poorly relay that information now for you today <laughs> please <laughs> <laughs> but like the, the the concept of okay so in the ancient world right you're a mom ma- you're a mother you're a mother you've got your beautiful daughter your beautiful daughter you raised her you spend every day together and then one day your husband is like, okay, so I've met somebody cool down at the pub. 
not at the far, I don't know, somewhere, and we're gonna, <laughs> you know, the daughter's getting married. And like the likelihood of you, of you seeing your daughter again is actually very sw- slim because it's not like, and they're sure, you know, living in the same neighborhood, like you don't have a plane, like communication is not what we know it today. Like you can't send your daughter an email. So it's like she's gone. She's gone with this man, and you'll probably not see her. And so this is kind of what Jamita's going through. She's like, my daughter is gone. She's married now, and I will never see her again. And her fight, her, her fight against bureaucracy to get her daughter back <laughs> is just it's it's fantastic. But there's also like the opportunity to like talk about Persephone because Persephone is a, a a dear to yourself, we don't really ever get anything where she's like, my name's Persephone and this is my day and this is what it looks like. She she doesn't have like a huge, like people talk about her, but she does mm-hmm. not say anything that much herself. So you're like, what? So there's a lot of like, again, and I referenced like the beginning of the, the interview where we brought up like, you know, uh, the, the gaps, the gaps. They mm-hmm. haunt me at night. I just want to know. The imagination runs wild. So, like, I just, there's, there's a lot you can do for, like, Persephone's agency within that story. There's, like, a lot of ambiguity around, like, you know, she eats, like, the pomegranate seeds, but I'm, like, I mean, clearly, like, there's rules, so she knows that she shouldn't eat things down there because she'll have to stay there, but she still eats it anyway, so you're, like, whoa, why, though? <laughs> like... <laughs> why would you do and like just the question around that I'm like did you want to stay what the fuck is happening oh my god and there's a, there's a lot there again what's so interesting about it too is this like this massive shift and like you, you can very much explore the underworld and, and and how people felt about it in the sense that like and I'm I won't be the first person who's probably said this on your podcast and I won't be the last but like it's really obvious if you look at early works yeah the ancient world was really scared of dying. This is all very scary. But you find, like, as time goes on, like, you know, start to romanticize it a bit more. Like, obviously, mm-hmm. like, we we now in the modern world love to think about the afterlife. We're like, whoa, yeah, the afterlife. What's happening? <laughs> and I think that's because we, like, most of us kind of are under the assumption that we're going to live until we're very old that's the uh, you know that's the assumption we take that for granted but like people in the ancient world they they like the other day I was like what, what was the life expectancy and it was like mm. 20 20 or 30 <laughs> I'm like I, I'm, I assume it's less if you're a woman because you're giving birth um oh god yeah <laughs> you know we expect babies to live and I'm like they're not living they're not living back then <laughs> it's no. pretty rare <laughs> Like you have a lot of them. Yeah. So like death was very scary, and you know I think matching up those two points and like how it gets more, I guess in the Odyssey they talk about like Persephone a little bit, and she's very scary. She's very scary in the Odyssey. The dread goddess. They're like, they're like, it. oh my god, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I'm so like, who is this woman? She sounds incredible. But, like, they have all of that. And, and, you know, they talk about the underworld and it's very scary. And then you've got Virgil later on. And he's got, like, pretty much this really extended, like, description of what the underworld has. And it's got, like, you know, your heavenly sections as opposed to, you know, just death, 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 and more death. Sad, sad death. It sucks here. So, like, they have more, more of a concept of, like, you know, you, you might have like an awesome time in the underworld. I don't know. You might. You, it, it could be good. Yeah, it could be good. And I think that that's super interesting. So I think that really like. I'm sorry. This was a very this is a very long winded, but essentially, like, I, love I it. think I think about that a lot within writing Laura Olympus because I love the idea of like the chicken and the egg, which came first. Mm. So, like at the beginning of Laura Olympus, you've got like you know this very kind of. Like a lot of people look at it and they're like, "That's not not that's not how this is supposed to be." And I'm like, "Well, I'm getting there. <laughs> like, I'm still <laughs> writing it." And I love the concept of getting to like how, without spoilers, you know, going from point A to point B. Like, why is it like this? I suppose a good example of this is like currently in the world of Laura Olympus is they, and this is like kind of a hard a mechanic for me to work out. But essentially, I was like, so. Do they even have anything that, like, remotely resembles winter? 
do they have that? Mm. So, like, they have that kind of in the underworld in the sense that they don't have the resources to have sun and, and plentiful fields of goodness. So it's like it snows there and it's very cold. And No, I, I could have made it, like, very warm because I think it's meant to be close to the center of the earth. So I was like, I'm just going to make it very cold instead, which I know may not make sense, but it's just because they have, like, like I mentioned, a lack of resources. In the mortal realm, in the world of Laura Olympus, is, the weather is always good. Like, it's either summer or spring. It's it's cracking. It's great. Um, <laughs> and so they do not yet have a concept of winter, but they will later mm. on. So, um, I mean, no spoilers, but, like, I mean, I guess this myth, this myth has been out for yeah. <laughs> a really long time, so I need spoilers, I guess. <laughs> There's um, things I think maybe you could see coming based on the myth. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. Not no, so much a spoiler. <laughs> the, 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 like, I think it's always, like, it's not a question of, so much as when is more like how will this happen and how will you go about it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What you were saying earlier about, you know, the the way Demeter and Persephone's story goes where it is, yeah, like her dad comes in and is like, this is your husband now. And then Demeter's like, what the fuck? Like, what? I have, I, <laughs> like technically speaking, what you've just done is legal because you have control, but like, I'm not going to let it stand. And I love that about her completely. And I had a woman on the podcast who... She specializes in like chthonic deities and oh, yeah. like the whole underworld. Um, Ellie Mac and Roberts is her name, and she was incredible. But she talked about how um, there's like this uh, realm of I think it was in part like Italian Greece mm-hmm. or Greece Italy whatever, where the the girls who were going off to be married would actually like, create their own. I forget it was like a tablet of some kind they would like make their own based around the myth of Persephone. Oh, yes. And, yeah. Have you heard yeah. of these things? Yes. Yeah. And also, didn't she like, um, I have like no source for this and I can't remember where I heard it, but she liked baby pigs. She was like, please give me a baby pig. Oh. And sac- sacrifice. <laughs> so I love I'm that. Like, but yeah, like, yeah, no, she's, it's, it's interesting hearing about in these, these areas, you know, cause like, again, mythology is very regional. Mm-hmm. it's very regional so yeah so regional. like i love hearing that she she was like kind of worshipped, worshipped as like a, a a divine goddess like her, her 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 marriage to hades was like a big ass deal and they were like yeah this, this, this. yeah no i I've, I've heard of this but i'm sure this woman has spoke about it much more eloquently than me <laughs> <laughs> she, she like specialized in it. it was fascinating to listen to for like i when i have academics on i'm just kinda like oh my god my mind is blown how can anybody be so like knowledgeable in one little subject i'm amazed but it was just in- so interesting to learn like the different ways the persephone was used where like some of the girls were like really afraid of their new husbands they were afraid to get married because it was terrifying and they mm-hmm. didn't know what was before them and so some of the depictions had that like that idea presented you know persephone going with hades unwillingly and then alternatively there were all these versions where the women where the girls were like excited they were eager they were looking forward to this chapter in their life and they presented persephone as like really thrilled to go with hades and so you had these like just this dichotomy of it just made it so much more personal and it gave me mm-hmm. such an interesting insight into their relationship because it really like you're there is so much you can interpret into their relationship like for good or bad right mm-hmm. yeah. and and i think it is so interesting to see the way that an actual ancient person also saw that it, it just makes it easier to be like, no, it is completely complex. It's based on individual people and how they saw it and how they saw it within their own lives and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just fascinating. <laughs> no, that sounds great. That sounds great. Yeah. No, I have, um, it is, it is, it is uh, super interesting to hear about like, you know, if you are going by region, what was more important to them? And like, obviously, like some the, the, the life of someone in Athens is going to be very different to the life of someone out in Sicily. And it's like, mm-hmm. and like a lot of the times, like a lot of the information that we have is very like Athenian. So it is great to yeah. hear about these other places. And also like the other thing is this is a, this is over a long time. Yes. It's over yes. a long time. Like, correct me if I'm wrong. It's just like 700 years between yeah. like, the Odyssey and um, the Aeneid. I think it's seven hundred years. At That's least, a long time. at least, and yeah. That, like Shakespeare is closer to us than that gap. <laughs> That's my go-to. I'm always saying that. I'm yeah. like every time I'm trying to drill that into people's heads is like 
if you because people are always wondering well what's right and what's wrong and it's like no it's just that there's 700 years so things change there's no right and wrong necessarily but yeah exactly it's like it's like looking back to shakespeare's time and being like why isn't everything exactly the same as it is now (laughs) yes like it's like i always think about it as kind of like like how we look at sorry this is like kind of a tangent but i knew this woman who used to give uh lectures on like fashions of the elizabethan period Mm. and she oh she was so pretty she would talk about like how they dyed the fabrics and all that stuff but anyway I won't I won't uh, go d- too deep into that but she did have like this discussion about basically like the fashion that was in the Titanic and like the outfits that Rose has are basically would be she'd be like rocking up onto the Titanic dress in like 80s style versus like <laughs> now and we'd be like yeah. why is this very 80s person here with their very <laughs> 80s look and I just I love it so much like just like it is yes yeah, it's, it's, it's a big time big place lots of different rules lots of different kings I mean there's a lot going on there's no strict dogma so that's why it's so interesting. And you see people fighting about stuff. And I'm like, no, guys, chill out. You're right. And you're right. And you're right. And you're right. And like, you over there in the back, you might be wrong. But that's cool. Like, <laughs> you're close you're, enough. <laughs> like, like, occasionally someone will like, be like, oh, my God, have you heard of this? And I'm like, no. And then it turns out that they're talking about Hades Town. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, <laughs> like, some people are going to be wrong. But for the most part, there's like, oh my god, this is so much to go on. There's so many different perspectives. It's, it's very good. It's very, very good. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it is so interesting though, just even the connection to Hades Town, like the way that people will take in a piece of adaptation, like some kind of a, a piece of classical reception. Mm-hmm. And then they will turn it as if like, obviously that whole thing came from a myth. It's like, that happens to me a lot just with people questioning things. Like, I mean, I think a great example and maybe one that you want to talk about too, because I find her particularly interesting in Lore Olympus, but is Minthi. So like everyone, everyone asks me about her. (gasps) And I think you're probably a huge part of that. (laughs) Okay, look, I had no... (laughs) Yeah, I I know. I want to hear your thoughts on her because I I like looked into her once and I was like, oh, She's like in two different places, like really late, like not like really late sourcing. I'm so fascinated by this character. And like, you're not the only one who uses utilizes her, especially in Hades and Persephone adaptations. But this character who's like kind of an afterthought note, like in one source has become this like big epic, like foil. And I find that fascinating. So I, I yeah. want to hear how you created her. So like, huh. <laughs> so it's, it's, She's definitely, like, one of those figures that is definitely, like, you can only really find her, like, in fragments. Yeah. And they're usually from, like, like first century BC or AD. Like, they're really, they're so fascinatingly late, but interesting. Yeah. I love it. You're like, excuse me? No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, like, I mean, in my research, I was like, I literally can only find these little bits on her. And... I think there's two conflicting uh, points that I found about her, and this is the gist. It's either one, she, uh, there's Hades and Persephone, they're married, and she's like, this, that he has either is wanting to partake in or, is, is, or has, and then she basically is walking around being like, oh my god, I'm so much better than Persephone. <sighs> the kind of thing, essentially, in Persephone is like, wow, excuse me now you're a plot so what do you think of that <laughs> or there is like another version where she Minthi or Minth is Hades current consort and then he's like so I hate to break it to you but I just I went to the as I got a, a wife she's here now uh this is kind of awkward and she's mad and she <laughs> goes to uh like I guess the mortal realm for lack of a better description, and again shoots her mouth off, and it's like, well, I'm better than her, like, and to me, it's like, well, fuck you, and <laughs> turns her into a plot. She's like, no one's better than my daughter, <laughs> and like, turns her into a plot. <laughs> and I'm like, sorry, I shouldn't laugh because it's very no, boring. I mean, but like, yeah, so, but it's Greek math, but yeah, yeah you yeah. get like these two. <laughs> 
So I guess like my adaptation comes from like models may not know, but I assume that most uh, nymphs and other immortal creatures or like demi creatures understand what gods are like, which are that they <laughs> should be avoided. Like <laughs> they're kind of like that they just do what they feel like and they should be avoided at all costs so I can't imagine what would be going through your head to be like you know what I'm just gonna pop off like I'm just gonna yeah. totally go <laughs> off I'm like who is this this nymph who's just like really comfortable with going off and that just really informs it informs the whole story of like how I write her I'm like yep okay so you've got this nymph and she's like totally comfortable with basically saying that she's better than Persephone <laughs> and I'm like by all accounts Persephone is like any description that you get of her like she's clearly like the top shelf according to (laughs) (laughs) these ancient texts like this is the poet I think it's notice oh yeah 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 Yeah, yeah. he's wild Um, so he has this whole paragraph that literally I'm obsessed with where he basically writes about how all the youth gods are like whoa excuse me this goddess is very good looking. So we're all going to go to like Demeter and offer up these gifts and be like, okay, gosh, like I think Hermes is like, you get my scepter, here you go, you can have this. And <laughs> I think Hephaestus says something. And I think even, I think even there's a line, sorry, I should have it in front of me, but I don't, I haven't read oh, it in a little while, but like there's like a bit where Ares is like going to give up his rioting with, with Aphrodite and I'm like oh my god is rioting with Aphrodite oh my this god is very saucy so clearly that sounds amazing so clearly she's she's very just she's hot uh, she's, she's, yeah she's she's obviously got something going on there <laughs> <laughs> and yeah to me she's just like I'm not having it it's great I I love that I've been slowly reading bits and pieces of Nona's um for Cadmus and Harmonia content because they're oh, yes. my people yeah and yeah that that Dionysiaca is something yes. else as a source yeah it is wild and it's also from like the Hellenistic period too like mm-hmm. it's also so late and no it's not even I think it's much later I think it's like I don't even know it's, it's very, very scandalous late. it's and very it's, yeah and it's, it's like on a book we're like describing like Persephone having a bath and everything oh my god I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure like d- don't quote me <laughs> oh no I mean I, I I'm, trust like, you. I'm pretty sure there's like a bit where she's she like is doing she's working on her loom and she gets real hot and then she has a bath and Zeus like <laughs> sees her somehow in the where, where she's having a bath and like exits the house of Hera I think that's the words that I use oh, no. but I, it's very scandalous and I'm like what excuse me excuse yeah. me yeah <laughs> yes oh that's great Well, okay, that kind of even just mentioning some of those characters now, I'm I'm curious I'm curious about a couple of things. First, uh-huh. do you also obsessively use the website th- theoi.com? Yes. Every yeah. day. Every yeah, day of my life. It's, Cause yeah. it's great because it like tells you things but also tells you where to go find them. Exactly. Which is yeah. like a big deal to me because I'm like, you can tell me something. But like, I'd love to know where it is. Like, okay, I am I, the same way. I'm, and I find we're rare. We're a rare sort who's like, I need you to tell me the thing, but I also desperately need to know where I can find it in the original source. People can tell you things, and that's great. But like, where is it? Like, I just want to read it too. Like, I just want to know. Yeah. So that is what's great about that website is it has its scholarly sources, and you're like, thank you. Now I can write my thing and. Again, like, I guess this relates to, like, Laura Olympus as well. Is I think some people think it's meant to be, like, you know, a beat-for-beat beat thing. Like, a beat-for-beat beat interpretation. And I'm like, no, no, no. This is, no. this is like, something else. Like, it's inspired. And obviously, I've thought about it a lot. Like, I think about it every day of my life. <laughs> like, the last half decade. Please don't cite it as a scholarly source, for the love of God. Please don't write your essay and add in that, like, Hades made 
Persephone an espresso in his kitchen. <laughs> like, that's never happened. He never made her an espresso, guys. Hold out. Cancelled today. <laughs> Telling lies. <laughs> like, I have to say, though, like, the fact that, like, the fact that it is not at all a beat for beat telling of the myth is why I love Lore Olympus. Like I have a lot of trouble with Hades and Persephone myth or uh, retellings in certain cases because they often, I think try to stay too literal. And then I have too much trouble with the, like the darkness that is inherent in a lot of the literal myth and yours doesn't it. You've like separated yourself from all the dark bits in that way. I hope this, I, I'm, I'm hoping this comes across as good as I mean it and I'll cut it accordingly. But like, that's why I love Laura Olympus versus like every other one that I've come across because I'm like, you're not making Demeter out to be like some, I don't know. I guess most of them just make Demeter out to be this like horrific monster of a mother and it bums me out. Yeah. I mean, Okay. Like, I mean, like a lot of people, you know, read Laura Olympus and they are very like frustrated with the character Demeter as I show her. And I have thoughts on this. Like, so I really like Demeter. I really like her. For me, I think about she reminds me of the type of mother who is like, we're going to the cinema. We're going to the movies. But I will not buy you that terrible movie popcorn. I will stay home. And I will make you some homemade popcorn that you will then (laughs) have in your own little baggie to take to the cinema. And it will be so much better for you. And like, yeah, there are times in Lola Olympus where like, Demeter is definitely not perfect. She definitely, you know, has her moments where you're like, gosh, Demeter, you shouldn't have done that. But she also has like some... Uh, redeemable qualities and I think a lot of the things that she does within Laura Olympus is because she's very frightened she's very very frightened because she is like experienced the world in such a way which has caused her to be like oh no I really want you know I really want my daughter to live the type of life that you know I want to live and and I think you know, she's she's definitely far from perfect, but I think as the story goes along, people will be like, oh, that's why she is the way she is, and that makes her a sympathetic character. Mm-hmm. So I don't, like, entirely think, like, I think people do, you know, and this is no shade to them, like, however you want to tell your story, it's absolutely up to you. That's fine. You do your thing. But, like, um, <laughs> for me personally, I just, I personally, when I go about, like, writing characters for the most part I want them to do things that are wrong but also be redeemable Mm -hmm. and also be like sympathetic so like they're not going to get everything right I I like the concept of like almost making the characters like polarizing where you know like some people are going to be like this really annoys me and some people will be like oh I really relate to this and I really enjoy those types of conversations where you know people can then come to understand each other a little bit better. I really enjoy Persephone in the se- in, within the story because I'm like, yeah, she did, like, kill a whole bunch of people. <laughs> and I enjoy the conflict of that with her character where she, you know, seems very nice and she's trying to, like, reconcile those, you know, those things. And it just, it makes for a very exciting and rewarding writing experience. So, like, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, people you know at times we'll look at Demeter in the context of Laura Olympus and be like oh man she's 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 not it she's not it but I'm like just wait (laughs) no I think you've shown enough progression anyway like she does still progress even even as much as you've written so far Mm -hmm. like I can see you can still see her grow in that way because I yeah I know what you mean but I mean not to just like reassure you which you probably don't need but I really love her in Laura Olympus and I'm picky with those thank you (laughs) But yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, you know, uh, I mean, I, I know I have probably a, like a very specific approach to like how I portray the characters and, you know, that's going to be different from like how other people do their retellings. Mm-hmm. And again, what people do with their retellings is definitely up to them and more power to yeah. them. Like I'm certainly not here to be like, well, I did this, so I'm going to do that. I'm like, that's not what I'm about. That's not what I'm here for. Yeah. Yeah. No. And like, I don't want, I don't, I don't want it to sound like I'm judging people for what they create. It's more like for my inter- oh, yeah, like, enjoyment think, of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's different. Like, I think that's fine to be like, you know, sometimes something isn't just like, sometimes something's just not for you and that's totally yeah. cool bananas. Yeah. Well, and as somebody who is like, so just completely obsessed with the 
mythology and the original sources i sometimes do find it hard with certain retellings because i just, it's just like my personality and the way that i take in the myths yeah that it's just like yeah it's not always gonna work for me because i'm a bit of a lunatic when it comes to the original sources and like knowledge of them um but it's i think i just yeah i really enjoyed the the lightness i guess of the character or of a lot of your characters certainly not all of them there's definitely darkness in <laughs> this too but i want i'm so curious about your choice to make Aphrodite and Ares like basically if not officially together I don't know if they're like officially together I kind of like that Ares Uh, is kind of like the guy who's like lying around on the couch all the time but yeah uh, what are okay my my thoughts on that are it's like (laughs) I I love them (laughs) you know what I did not think I'd be talking about them today so now I'm like pulling Mm. a major play but I really like the idea of Aphrodite being like pretty well organized in her own life like I kind of look at her as being very like she's got her own things going on she's very like I am an adult woman (laughs) out here wheeling and dealing (laughs) and like we don't get that much like again Ares is like one of those characters that you don't like hear that much about like I mean he gets some stuff but I find him like Again, it's like that whole like curiosity of like, what else is he doing? How'd they get together? Like, and I, you know, I've, you hear a lot of people reason this, and they're like, they're both very passionate people, and that's why they're together. They're, and I kind of view them in this kind of eternal on again, off again relationship, mm-hmm. where like <laughs> she, you know, they, they they love each other, but they may not necessarily be like, oh my god, like. We, we constantly need to be like devoted to each other forever. Like, I really like the concept of that movie Only Lovers Left Alive, where they've got like those two immortal vampires and they don't like they've been alive for so long that they travel the world in like different areas and they only see each other occasionally. And when they're together, they love each other so much. And I'm like, I think that's so romantic actually. <laughs> but I also haven't watched that movie in a long time. So if someone's <laughs> like, what are you talking about? I'll be like, I don't know. <laughs> it's a fever dream. <laughs> but I do like that concept of, yeah, them, like the characters, most of them are like immortal and I like to think about what that might do to someone's brain being alive that Mm. long and how that would affect you and how you would like go about managing your relationships if you are alive for that long and the progression of that. Yeah. Yeah. I really know that that very much speaks to, I think all of it, but also specifically them because that's kind of, I mean, I just, I have an attachment to them, but I, I completely agree with that general understanding of them. Just that kind of like, yeah, they're, you know, they love each other, but they're not, like, going to be at each other's side all the time. Yeah, they're like, because I don't think they get, I don't think they get married ever, unless... They're never technically together yeah, yeah, in the myths beyond just having a lot of kids, and therefore yeah, a lot of sex. Yeah, like, they don't have, like, they don't talk a lot about marriage between the gods, really. Like, I mean, you've got, like, Zeus and Hera, and you've got, like, Hades and Persephone, and you've got Poseidon and his wife. Amphitrite. Thank you. She's always fight. forgotten. She's <laughs> Not like, that it's your fault, but she just always is. <laughs> I was like, pronunciation, I can do it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. <laughs> but like his, his wife that he got via his dolphin side Oh, yeah. Trick. But yeah, they don't talk about like marriage that much. I mean, again, this is like why you go back to Hades and Persephone, because I'm like, this is a story about marriage, and you do have this whole bit in, I guess, I, I've got to cite like the Homeric hymn because I. Mm-hmm. In personal preference, I like it better than like the other most put together text, which is by Ovid, which I just, oh, you know, yeah. it's very like descriptive and very beautiful, but also it's very like, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely like it's a different type of story for sure. So I, I, I like my personal preference is, is the Homeric hymn. But like, you know, Hades does this whole bit where like she's leaving and he's like, I mean, this is probably like your not ideal situation, but like, like I've got all this stuff here. It would be pretty cool, and no one's allowed to like. Essentially, the translation is like people aren't allowed to insult you. I'll, I'll <laughs> fuck them up. Like you're not gonna lose face. You're not gonna lose honor. I'll destroy them. And it's like, I mean, obviously that's like problematic, but like, 
it is like, you know, you don't really get like a lot of these declarations within Greek mythology towards mm-hmm. women, towards goddess characters. And also this Theseus and his colleague, Pirithus, you know, they journey down into the underworld because oh, he's like, I deserve to have oh. the daughters of Zeus as, as brides. And I'm like, I don't know why you would do this. I think, I think I heard something, someone give a description. They did this because it was their destiny to do so and they couldn't avoid uh, no. it. But I don't know about no. it. But they, they head no. into the underworld. And Hades is just like in there, and he's like hi, and pretends to be nice to them, and then you know makes them be stuck to stone chairs forever. And I mean, well, one of them there forever. And I'm like, yeah, this is. I mean, obviously, again, problematic, but violent. But he's standing up for his life. He's like, I'm. Saying, and it's it's it, it doesn't happen like a huge amount in Greek mythology, so it's nice to you know, nice. <laughs> Even though no, I, I mean, I agree completely. There's, I don't even think you need to clarify that it's problematic about them being stuck to chairs for life. Like, they deserve it completely. Theseus is the biggest asshole of all of Greek mythology, and Pirithus is his best friend who then decided to, like, one-up him by being like, I'm going to go abduct the queen of the underworld. Like, if anyone deserved, like, eternal punishment, it's them. <laughs> So I, I stand by that. Okay, yeah, because he's like Mr. Forgetful. Mr. Forgetful. He, like he leaves his wife behind. Uh-huh. He like forgets to put up them sails. His dad dies. I'm like, uh-huh. Mr. And then he, you need to do he, some memory exercises. So you left your wife behind. I mean, yeah. And then like the whole Daughters of Zeus thing too. Like Theseus decides he needs Helen, except that she, according to more, most sources, She's like 12 at the time and he goes and kidnaps her to marry and then Pirithus goes for Persephone. So like they're also doing that together and Theseus just kills a ton of people and then marries his wife's sister after he left the first one on an island. Yeah. And like, <laughs> it's like yeah, no. the same dad, isn't it the same king? Where he's like, oh yeah. You left yeah. my other daughter on an island, but like, uh-huh. he was, I mean, sure. sure like, he also I, kidnapped an Amazon. Like, oh, yeah. he literally is the worst. <laughs> I think Ar- Ariadne, I-, I like to believe the myth where um, Dionysus comes and marries her instead. I, I think that's oh, lovely. Yeah. I'm like, oh, oh same. that's yeah. nice. That's nice. So I like that. I don't like her dying with exposure on the island. I'm like, don't make her die. No, no. <laughs> she was just trying to be helpful. <laughs> she doesn't yeah. deserve this. <laughs> No, I too stand by. She married Dionysus. After, well, I think most sure. people that. It's definitely yeah. more interesting. <laughs> yeah, he's better than Theseus anyway. Um, which, like, it, you know, you can decide how much to say or how much you allow me to keep on here. But I have to ask about you have set up Zeus and Semele oh, and yes. then left us hanging for so long. I know. Okay, look. <laughs> It's been so long. I think, like, <laughs> we're coming back. We're coming back. It's, okay, good. I mean, obviously, we're going to come back to it. Because some people are like, where's Dionysus? And I'm like, well, similarly. Yeah, I sim- know. But don't, don't think like, that, co- that did not pass me by. <laughs> I, was like, I think this is okay to leave it. It's fine. Um, okay. But, I mean, <laughs> eventually, he's going to make it to the Pantheon one way or another. I think, obviously... Um, in terms of writing something that is episodic, and this is clearly something that, like, you know, I know now. <laughs> but, like, when you, as a body of work, if this was all complete, this would, you'd not be waiting that long. You'd not be waiting that long to have, like, the resolution to this plot point. So I, would, <laughs> I think now, I mean, probably it would make more sense to, like, shift that plot point to, like, a different place in the story. But again, I, I kind of look at Laura Olympus as like, one day it'll be finished. And like, I'm writing for two audiences in the sense that like, there's an audience that reads from week to week, essentially, or like maybe from month to month. But then, you know, you have to think about the whole story as is. Like, how will this read in three sittings? Like, someone's mm-hmm. like, just come to it and they've read it like this. And it's, it's it definitely makes I think for a different read and I try to be mindful of both formats because obviously you do need to be kind to the people who are reading it from week to week because they you know they put me where I am thanks week to week Mm -hmm. people I see you (laughs) 
Thank you. But, you know, it definitely makes sense to have it be cohesive as a big whole piece, like a big whole text. So that this is a very difficult balance. So I think Mm -hmm. in hindsight, I probably would have shifted that event somewhere else. But it just so happened that it fit in there, unfortunately. Like, I don't think, like, obviously, like, I don't intend for forever Hades to have fallen out with his brother Zeus. Yeah, like clearly Dionysus is making his way into the story one way or another, so it's fine. That's what matters, yeah. honestly. That's what matters. We love him. Um, and that just reminded me, I don't know how, because we weren't talking about it, but I'm so I I I'm trying to like phrase things in a way where I'm not just saying like, I love this part, talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> um but like I love the Titans. I love that you made them like enormous like monumental like and they're and i mean chronos is like the best level of creepy that i could have ever imagined in a way that i'm like he's kind of dorky to me in the mythology because it's just like he just does such stupid shit and but like it's so violent but also it's just so like over the top but i find in his like enormous blue and scary is he blue or gray or he's something where you're just like you're terrifying yeah he's kind of like a galaxy color Mm. sometimes he's red sometimes he's blue um i kind of like the idea of the 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 primordial gods being very big because they're like the Mm. first ones so they're very big and i think it's like inconsistent in the sense that i think they could probably make themselves very small if they felt like it Mm. like they, they they can you know take whatever size they want so I, I kind of like imagine that every time they like procreate, their offspring kind of gets smaller and smaller, which is <laughs> like, it's such a weird thing to think about. And I don't, I don't I know like how it. I landed with this. Like, cause you see it kind of like, in um the Hades, the game, like I have not played it myself because I was too busy Neither, making my it... comic and in my, yeah. body game, my arm will drop off. But like, uh, Zagreus in it is very small and Hades is very big. And hmm. I kind of, like for me like again because you've got like characters in Laura Olympus who are also very small and very big and I like the idea is like as they go along they get smaller and smaller so like you know like Hades is quite big he's he's meant to be like a big guy who needs to buy like a bespoke larger car like this very (laughs) I like I kind of wish I made him a little smaller because it makes him very difficult to draw in proportion to things Cause I'm like, mm. I have to draw him in a car. Like, I'm like, I've got this drawing of a car and like either Persephone has to look really tiny in the car or Hades has to look really big in the car. And it just, it makes it really hard. I really, I really <laughs> like dug myself a hole on that one. <laughs> being, <laughs> being frank, it's so difficult because it's like she, like she's very, it's just tiny. She's tiny, but also she gets very big, which is like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just love the idea of her being very big. But yeah, she's she's like the littlest and I kind of like do this because she's the latest to the Pantheon. Like so I kind mm-hmm. of get fa- I'm fascinated with the structure of the Pantheon and like when yeah. various deities came into it and it's it's all very interesting. Like I like again talking about not having answers to things, but if you even think about like the whole Titanomachy and like the um the, the division of wealth. So you know, you've got these three brothers and they're like, we get all this stuff. We, we, we get these realms and the women who are there are just like, well, okay. And they kind of get the earth. This ranges from source to source, obviously, mm-hmm. but they, they don't get a lot. And so for me, a lot of the tensions in Laura Olympus are kind of based on this division where like these characters got a lot these characters got a li- little and that is where like they've got like this historical tension with them that never really leaves them um and you don't hear a lot about it and I'm like I want to know about this like I, like obviously this is probably like a very traumatic situation like mm-hmm. like we read about it and we read about like Hades being like uh, devoured and these characters being devoured and it's funny but then you try and think about what that might really be like and it's very scary yeah. and like you think about like I don't know even Gaia being like forced to keep her children up inside her body yeah <laughs> like that must be very painful it's just I don't know it's super again very compelling like there's lots there yeah. to, there's lots to write about and like I know I've taken like at times a very like literal like it's very literal 
and you could probably like be much more metaphorical with it but i'm like so he's literally like the, these characters were like literally swallowed by Kronos, spent some time chilling out in there and also oh god this is like not my a thing of my invention or thought i've heard like a couple of people say it. like obviously i don't want to not accredit people but i think there's like some lecture that i listened to where like the order of which they came out of Kronos is really important in the sense that mm-hmm. like Hades was like the first son and then on leaving he ended up being the last son so he ends up being like his importance is kind of damaged in this way where he should be like the first son the best one but he's not and he's suddenly now mm-hmm. the, the last son who gets like the least rights to things which I think definitely uh I think that's a really persuasive argument. I'm like, yeah, because they do have make such a big, you know, this, uh, first sons are a real big deal in classical uh, literature. So, yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I've never thought about it in terms of the sons. I always just think about it in terms of like all the children because it's oh, like yeah. Zeus and Hestia are the first in, first out. But yeah, it is so much more meaningful in that world to think about it like when it comes to the men because they would be the ones to inherit everything anyway. Yes. So that's yeah. very interesting. Yeah, I hadn't I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think about, like, in this context, if we're talking about Laura Olympus, because obviously another elephant in the room, incest, uh, <laughs> uh, and riding around this is very difficult. It's very difficult, and I'm constantly mm-hmm. in fear of, of messing it up. I feel like I get that. I'm in a cat suit. I'm in the museum. There's lasers around me. I'm, like, jumping... <laughs> around the lasers like trying to avoid the incest and one day one of these days someone's gonna have like a like gotcha moment with me and I'm just waiting for it it's so hard so yeah I made the like again this is where you have to like take liberties because either you're gonna have to be like okay so there's just incest and like it's very hard (laughs) it's a very hard selling point in a modern context like if you're talking yeah. to like I mean obviously if you're talking to someone who's like oh I know a lot about Greek mythology and this is a fact that I know and have known for a long time and I've moved past it <laughs> like yeah clearly, you have to though like you have to <laughs> I don't know this is like another question that I have where clearly like I know in the ancient world they were aware of like incest so they knew not to marry their sisters and I think <laughs> That they knew not to do this, so I really want to know what they thought about like these relationships between the gods and like how they viewed mm-hmm. them. That I'm very curious about that. So if you ever find the answer to, to that, please let me know. But anyway, yeah. like you've got Kronos, and I kind of had to like separate off their sisters in like a different way. So Hestia, Hera, and Demeter, in this case, are like made by Metis. She's, she's like, I'm going to make them. So they're not related by blood and they're like made from like, like it's more like it's kind of etiological in the sense that they're made from things from like the earth or things Mm -hmm. around that she found. So there is, you know, obviously I had to take some liberties to avoid the incest. And like, (laughs) again, like Demeter Demeter made Persephone on her own. But I don't Mm -hmm. think this is like, (laughs) yeah, I don't think this is like, you know, it's not out of the realm of possibilities. Like, there's, like, a lot of, you know, times where, I don't know, like, Hera made Hephaestus on her own. Like, she was literally like, I'm so mad that Zeus had Athena on his own. I can make a baby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll show you. Like, so I thought it's not out of the realm of possibility to, for these characters to be, like, making these babies on their own. I think that's, you know, it's fine. It's, oh, absolutely. Like, don't worry, well, everyone. It's fine. Yeah. No, but God, it's better. Yeah, I mean, making making those liberty or taking those liberties is certainly better than being like. So here's the thing: Hades is Persephone's uncle on both sides because yeah, like, on both sides he's like that's a double like, uncle. But he's also double to make, uncle. <laughs> to make it more difficult, like even in ancient Greece, they were like apparent. So they didn't view marrying your uncle as incest either. Like, no. so that, that's where that, again, if you Gross. go and listen to this thing by Elizabeth Van Diver, which I encourage everyone to do, because yeah. it's so great. Yeah, it's really common to, because I think it's, it's super common to marry your uncle because he knows your dad. 
I know yeah. you so well. Oh my and god, keeps, that's exactly it. Right? And it keeps, he and it knows keeps your the dad. wealth like close by because your dad's like, yeah. but my brother's my best bud. It makes sense and it keeps the wealth close by and I know where all my stuff's going. <laughs> so like they didn't they didn't think that was incest, but they certainly thought like brother sister was incest. But that was like where they drew the line and I think oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think for the gods it must have just been that like there were no other options, yeah. so somehow it's okay, where it's like it just doesn't count for them, because... Like, yeah, I mean, this is like, uh, if you're dealing with any sort of, like, pantheon, I feel like this is very much the case across the board. Because mm-hmm. like, who else are they going to marry? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, who are they going to... They're like, they, well, they're not going to... I Maybe they're just like, what's worse, getting with a mortal, which I think they knew is, <laughs> is beneath them, or, like, their, their own siblings. I don't know. It's very, like, I have questions. I just, I have, again, questions, which I want to know the answers to. I'm very curious. Yeah. All I want in the world is all the missing texts. That's all I want. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe they just, like, it's 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 not a big deal. <laughs> I don't, yeah. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. There's probably yeah. just lack of options. I don't know. There was one question that I wanted to finish it off with. I just wanted, I would love to know who is your favorite character to write or to draw whichever is sort of the more fun thing for you like who do you really get a thrill to to work with like who, who do I like drawing this um, yeah or just like who do you're like oh I get to make I get to do this episode today this per, this particular uh, character anytime, is like a favorite anytime it's like any any romance based thing to do with Hades and Persephone mm-hmm. which is actually like really limited at the moment in this comic about them so anytime I get to like <laughs> do anything I'm like yeah it's so exciting uh, or anything that involves setting the tone mm. so there are definitely uh, not all episodes are created equally that's impossible <laughs> so I definitely enjoy the big swirly artistic ones where I get to be like mm. this is more metaphorical as opposed to like ones where they're like standing in a kitchen yeah. I'm like they're in the kitchen and this is Hades Kitchen, and this is like the 52nd episode of Hades Kitchen. So that does not, <laughs> like, in the year 2001 does not entice me that much anymore, but if you were like, oh, you know, that's a big swirly picture of Persephone turning into butterflies, I'd be like, yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do that today. <laughs> yes, or like, I don't know, just anything where I get to draw them, like, using their powers, that's very fun. Yeah. That's a fun thing to do. Uh, yeah, no, I'd say still Hades and Persephone. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I, I can immediately, like, as soon as you start talking about that, I can then picture scrolling those ones where you yeah. and I can see exactly what you mean, especially when I think you work with like some flashbacks with when it comes to like the Titans and mm-hmm. stuff like that. I feel like so often they're really like visual and cool, and like there's, yeah, there's a lot. I'm not, yeah, I, well, I, I'm artistic in my own way, but not in describing it, <laughs> but I could like picture it what you mean. And also, like, anything to do with, like, the law of the world that they mm. live in. So, like, again, like, a little while, someone was, a while ago, someone was like, I didn't even know why Laura Olympus is called Laura Olympus. And I was like, I can see why you might ask that question. But I'd like to think that, like, now it's, like, more apparent is it's, like, if this is some law that they have. Like, it may not necessarily be, like, factually correct, but in this universe, this is, like, again like I mentioned before, about, like, not knowing the answers to questions. I'm like, here's the answers to my question. I'm trying to answer myself within this body of text. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I love that. Yeah, it's, it, I, I just really enjoy the way you're working with all of that and the way you are kind of, I guess, answering those questions that we have, which is nice because I, too, am obsessed with getting the answers <laughs> to, like, yes. what we don't know. My people are Cadmus and Harmonia, and mm-hmm. I they also are like deeply lacking in sourcing Mm -hmm. except for that weirdo known us, which is like with his completely bizarre epic, (laughs) but, (laughs) but yeah, so I, I get it. It's just like, there's so many questions. There's so many missing pieces. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. No, it's been a blast. It's been a blast. Oh, nerds, thank you all so much for listening. I mean, this was so much fun. If you haven't read Rachel's webtoon, Lore Olympus, 
please highly recommend. It's really fun and beautiful and a great and lovely adaptation of Greek myth generally and the Hades and Persephone myth specifically. But what I love so much about Laura Olympus is the way she's adapting so many myths into this world and the way she's doing them. So I just generally highly recommend this webtoon. It's gorgeous and then obviously highly recommend it in book form too. Um, should be available wherever you live in book form again as of today, the day this episode is being released. So thank you all so much for listening. Um, this is one of my most exciting conversations and one that I know so many of you are going to be so excited by and that alone just makes me so much more excited. So I just, I really appreciate you all. You are all the best. This job is very fun. Greek mythology is super cool and dorky in the absolute best way. I am Liv and I love this shit.